And depending on how big of a delay, it's just up to you. No, no, 100% we're going on the other screen. Okay. Oh, Andy, we are good. Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh, we are like a bunch of sniffling. I know. <laughs> I know. We're live. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, we are live. We are live. We are live. All right, I'm going to go and share. Yeah. Sorry, don't mind us. We we stare at our phones the first few minutes every week, and then we share the post on Facebook to our own page. Cool. So, Feel free. Well, <laughs> but if you, turn, if you have your phone here, you want to make sure the volume's off. Oh, yeah. Do that. Yeah. It'll be good once the kids are old enough. Live. And we can get free slave labor and get them doing this stuff. Yeah. Like the way Brian Carey do. <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty sure I pay, I pay them. <laughs> All right. Let's check it out. I think it's, yep. Share it out. Hey, guys. Hello. Sorry for uh, delaying here. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hold on. I'm just trying to make sure it's not letting me see comments. There we go. There you go. You're All right. Easy, and if you're so. here, hello, please comment so we can see you. We're, we're using new technology today to have uh, Coach George here with us. So make sure you say hi in the comments because we don't get necessarily all the pop-ups that shows us that you're watching. So if you can hear us, okay, if you're here and you're listening, give us a, a like, give us a comment so we know we're all good. Um, I want everyone to know that... Uh, can you open it on your page so I can manage yeah. both comments? Thanks. Yeah. That this is a very special day. Um, obviously, George is here, but you know, this guy right here is suffering from man cold. And I think we all know what happened the last time we had a man cold. We we didn't have a show. So I really want to give a big round of applause <laughs> that he is gracing us with his presence today, even though he's fighting a man cold. So Kudos to you, boo. I'd, I'd, <laughs> love, you I'd love to headbutt you, number one. <laughs> but number two, I love, you know, I've got my own theory on this whole man cold thing. You know, uh, everyone always complains as man cold, man cold. You know what? I think maybe George will agree with this. Uh, possibly. I doubt Depends. it. George is a smart <laughs> man, but he's so uncomfortable. But you know what? The reality <laughs> is this. I'd like to see my cold, okay, with you carrying 220 pounds and, and this mass inside with your i'd um, like to see you push an eight pound baby out your hoo -ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay about <laughs> what your concern is thank you see yeah okay right. yeah that's touche mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I, I heard the, it's the equivalent of us pushing a lemon out of our yeah give it a whirl <laughs> go live i'm sure people would love to see it Oof, that'd be terrible. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but not sorry. George is like, what is going on? George has no idea what he has just stepped into. He's like, uh, I thought we were attacking goalies. Now we're talking about lemons and penises. <laughs> <laughs> Quick start to the morning here. Woo. Wake up. Wake up. Here we go. All right. So that was a really good effort on your shirt back. Listen, but if there's any doctors out there, please. Let, let me know if there's any truth. Because I could have the same cold, yet I'm still getting the kids ready. I'm still making dinner. I'm still cleaning up. I'm still working, still doing everything. Yeah, but let's add 100 pounds on you. Great. With it. <laughs> I did all that while I was also pregnant. Yeah, but when you're pregnant, what do you get? What do you put? Oh. 30 more pounds? Oh. <laughs> I, we're going to go find one of those uh, simulators <laughs> that will allow you to feel what pregnancy feels like. Can any women help me out here? I mean, in the comments. Yeah, <laughs> so if you see us, we literally have a box of tissues here. Because I'm sick too, but you know, I'm not gonna and Coach <laughs> George is sick. Everybody. That you know, I'm yeah. over this winter. We just all keep getting reinfected. Oh, yes. But okay, we've got Coach George here with us today. George is the man. The man. <laughs> the <agent. laughs> I'm not living up to that pressure, but okay. Oh. Say what you will, I can't control that. <laughs> he is um, the newest addition to the Bloodline Hockey family. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Pumped. Pumped, brother. Pumped, pumped. I'm the one who's excited. Learned a lot in short time. And so I can only imagine what this journey is going to bring. Oh, for sure, man. For sure. It's it's cool. It's uh, it's funny right now through all the years. We've known, we've known each other for at least, what, 20? We're probably in the 20 realm. 20, maybe. Well, actually, geez, I was thinking about this the other day. It's probably closer to 30. Because I knew you when I was playing for Little Flyers, and 
I hate admitting it, but this year is my 30th anniversary. The, the, our um, high school reunion would be my high school reunion, 30 years. I'm like, oh God, where's time go? Oh, it's like this, man. That's so crazy. I've got my 20 year coming up in June. So uh, yeah, thanks for that. That's still 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things, so George, talk a little bit about like, obviously with uh, people, I know we're going to have some people on here that know you, some that don't know that some, but talk a little bit about your background. Um, you'll get into a little bit of your history, right? Of your playing history, coaching history, all that stuff. And then maybe even get into your transformation that you've gone through as a coach, all that stuff through, you know, mindset process and all that stuff, just kind of give me up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm much like yourself in the sense I was a product of the area. Um, I'm considered a late bloomer because I was in learned to skate classes at 14 and 15, didn't really start playing travel hockey till 16. Um, by the grace of God and some talent, you know, a little bit of talent, <laughs> call that. There's no glory stories here. I uh, got to play junior, some division. Division three hockey, played minor league, but for everybody out there, I was a <laughs> painfully average minor league backup. But uh, same time, too, I thank God for that experience of, you know, for starting that late. It was kind of cool to make it to there. And after playing, you know, turned my passion into coaching. Um, and that's been, you know, it's funny where I became so interested in what you brought to all your athletes. I was the product of the same thing you had growing up. We were always taught to figure it out. And the reason why you have a coach is, okay, help me figure it out. What am I supposed to be thinking? And when I first came in, it's like anything, because you're an athlete, everything, I'm not justifying it, but when I first started coaching, as a goal, you're very individual, because it's individual-based performance. Because, you know, if you make a mistake, a red light goes off, and 10,000 people let you know what they think about you. And when I became a coach, I thought it was like imprinting what I thought they should be. And also you want to claim the athletes that are yours. Oh, I coached this one. And thankfully I've been around a lot of good people and realized it's not about me. It's, you know, getting the athletes to understand what their strengths are. And an example I use with all my goalies, I'm fortunate to coach. You look in the NHL even, and there's 62 goalies. And no two play alike. Like Jonathan Quick can move better down, read the game better, like he plays a down a lot than anybody in the league. But then if you look at Braden Holpe, he doesn't play anything like Jonathan Quick. Mm -hmm. He's still a very good goalie, he, but he's more patient, stays on his feet. Mm -hmm. Our job as coaches is to, we give them a foundation of skills. You do need that. You're skating. You know, there are basic principles you need to have but then let them put their own blueprint on the game. We have to have the courage to find out what their strengths are and coach up their strengths. So that's been through influence of a lot of good coaches had around me. And then it really resonated when, you know, I started training with you. Awesome. That's awesome. So Paul, every, every step on there, is that, are we getting back on there? No idea. Hey guys, hey, sorry if there's um, a delay on our end between comments and all that stuff, put it there guys, we'll get back to you. Um, the way it's set up through the webinar style of Facebook, it's basically, it's easier for us to stay on Zoom. So unfortunately we can't see. And if you see me versus, looking down, it's because I'm managing comments. Yeah, she's managing today. it on that. And, but what I think is amazing about your story, it's funny, right? I love how you get um, so, you know, humble and modest about the fact that it fit, like put that in perspective, right? For anyone listening, 15, 16, to then for, that's your first time getting into travel and to have accomplished what you had accomplished. That to me, more than anything that I've always appreciated about you is, is amazing to me, right? Because that's just unheard of. Those are tales that are just like, it's like almost achieving the impossible. Well, how can that still happen? To end up playing division three, like just that alone, right? And being able to play NCAA is so hard. And within a couple of years, you were able to get yourself, get you to a place where you were good enough to be able to play at that level. And then on top of it, to go and play at minor pro level, it doesn't matter what it is on that, to be able to be there and to have the confidence for them to say, hey, yeah, you, you're you going to earn, you're going to be our backup <laughs> in and of itself is truly amazing and it shows a lot. And that's the part I think, we, you know, we've talked about this before of your value as a human being more than anything is the fact that you found a way to accomplish something that by standard sounds impossible. Like if you tell anybody that story, hey, I, 
I know this guy that in 15, 16 started playing and made it to D3 and then ended up playing minor pro. It, yeah, right. It, that doesn't even sound possible. And that's one of the things I love about your story is how you know, modest and humble you, you, you'll feel about it. But to me, I've always thought of like, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible that you pulled that feet off of because it's so unique, right? It's so unique. And that's something that as human beings, it's hard for us to value that, but that's something that's my, my role in life is to point that out to you and tell you how unbelievable that is <laughs> and uh, to, to express that. So I appreciate it, but uh, you know, I'd help a long way. And, uh, and, uh, I mean, God rest her soul. My mom, like she would change her job around. I, uh, if I could go to a skate at two in the morning because my buddy was a rank manager, would drop everything. Uh, there was a guy, he's now down in Florida, guy Ray Stazak, wasn't even a goalie guy, just um, was a guy, he played Archer Fish Bryan High School, but he ended up signing with Detroit. Yeah. And I remember telling him what my aspirations were. And he, you know, he, would, he was a humble guy, but he also like, come on kid, you're 17, you're on your second year of hockey, but to his credit, he would never take it easy on me. Like he would shoot on me like he was shooting on at the time, like his junior A guys that he was playing with. I'm like, oh geez. It's like, yeah, you got some catching up to do. This is what reality is. So that's awesome. Um, there's so many people along the way. It's you know, we don't even have enough of a show to um for yeah. me to thank everybody. So, you know, we have we know one uh Andy Richards, you know, Sarge took a gamble on me, took me with the little flyers and you know, they, you know, list goes on and on. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Huge, huge pointing that out, that the, the people that inspired that belief in you, and obviously between mom, the most powerful, and then everybody else. It's, uh, yeah, I, I feel you, you, it's, you feel blessed along the way of like to have that, right? Because that's the one thing we discuss all the time is that belief is one thing, but having a supporting cast is another. Yes. Part, especially when you're younger, you can't become confident and have belief until first you have other people building that up for you. It's a skill, right? You can't suddenly believe in something that you don't know exists. Adults know it exists. So it, it trickle down effect. But then when you get old enough and mature enough, then you understand what it means. Now the, the true power comes out. So it's, it's awesome to see how you know, fortunate you are on that end, but then what it's helped you and lined you up to be in life is, uh, is amazing. It's amazing to watch. All right, should we get to know so, George a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. After. All right. Well, so whenever we have a guest here on the Parent Chat, we do a couple of hot seat questions. So it's just like rapid fire. I'm going to ask you a question. The first thing that comes to mind, go with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll start off, I guess, easy. Um, but what is your favorite rank you've ever played or coached in? Wow. Okay. Can we break it up into two? Yeah. Um, let's see. Favorite rank I played in? Um, and it was for a short period of time because uh, was when I was with uh, Trenton for a short stint in 0304, then again a 506 at the time it was called Sovereign Bank Arena. It felt like a mini, and this is going to again date how old I am. It felt like a mini spectrum, you know. So growing up, that was our hockey mecca. Um, just felt at home there. The guys on that team, they accepted me like, you know. Um, they were just awesome. Like they, these were all accomplished pros. I was making a little bit of a, a minor comeback. That's another story, but they were just awesome. Uh, favorite rink to coach in. I'm a, I'm an old soul. Well, I'm also old as my, I'm, thank God my wife just walked away. She had a trip <laughs> after that, but uh, I loved my time at Princeton Baker arena. It just, there's so much history there and you're, that's where it gets real humbling. You see, names in the rafters but also the guy who the rink's named after yeah. and I was the coaches there like Ron Fogarty was there second time and then Guy Gadowski who's now at Penn State uh it was just a learning environment I'm a goalie guy but at the same time too just the talent that was there and the coaches the history you know it it brought me back to what hockey's about it got me away from the business of hockey and just got me to enjoy the environment that's awesome. That's awesome. Love it. All right. Favorite memory as a player or coach? Uh, as a player, you know, I, I, I got to be honest, my one and only pro shutout, October 30th, 1998, down in Texas. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, 
just, you know, our starter was sick with dehydration. And, you know, that's, <laughs> there's a saying, there's a, you know, the sun's got to shine on a dog's butt once a day. Well, that was the day that the sun shined on a dog's butt. So, <laughs> yeah. so I got that. And then coaching moment, um, I think it would be unfair for me to pick one because of dolls. Like, I mean, I had one of many just this past week. It wasn't even a goalie moment. I, you know, coached the 05 team with the Jersey Hitmen and the boys really shorthanded due to injury and they found a way to win a tournament this weekend. It was just fun to watch them accomplish what they did. Um, and then also you go back two weeks, my brother-in-law got his first NHL shutout and his first NHL start. That was awesome. And I remember... I'll just tell a quick story. I apologize. No, 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 no. Have that one. When he was, um, when I first started coaching him, first time I ever had him on the ice, like I'd coached his brother for a couple of weeks. And then Kevin, I think at the time was seven or eight. I come in and at the end of practice, just playing around, doing some breakaways and I shoot one. He gloves it. But then, you know, he throws the puck back at me and he's like, not good enough. Fast forward two years. And this has nothing to do with me. Like coaches always say, oh, I coached him. At 10 years old, and his parents can vouch for this, I grab them and I'm like, he's going to play Division One. You know, for those who are in coaching circles, like, then, you know, like trying to say a guy's going to play Division One at 10. And it had nothing to do with anything I was coaching him. You just watched instinctually little things he did without instruction. Mm -hmm. He was unflappable the way he watched pucks in, how he naturally did things. Oh, yeah. I was like, he just has it. And there's not, that's not a coaching thing. My only job at that point is when you realize what talent that is, manage it. Don't let them get too high on himself, but also cultivate it in the right way. So those are some of the, you know, sorry, got off track there. So. No, no, those are great. Those are great ones. That, that was one of the ones that uh, I was hoping you, you were going to bring up on that end because that's, that's awesome, right? Because again, to have that many years with somebody and to see that, coming to fruition is, is awesome as a coach. Yeah, Katie and I aren't parents yet, but uh, that was the one night where we felt like parents because we were sitting, the only way, like we tried to fly up, but she couldn't get off of work. Mm -hmm. We are watching it at a Miller's and you want to talk about nerves. Like I felt like I was playing. There was a good two or three times I thought I was going to heave. Oh. I'm like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Fun to watch. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, should I go to the next one? Mm -hmm. Most embarrassing moment. Oh God. Yeah. It come right to my head is <laughs> that one this, goes, <laughs> this goes to coach Vin's point where we got to play to our strengths and it wasn't the coach's fault. It's March 16th, 1999. <laughs> um, I had a coach that loved goalies who played, played the puck, play the puck, play the puck. And when you're not comfortable with something, you force the action. We were in a game, uh, third period, and we had had a good lead. They're coming back and guy does a scoreboard high dump. Like it's, I mean, way up and it's going toward the corner. So me, I just blindly coach wants me to play the puck. So I just put my head down. Like there was no reading the play. I just put my head down, skate to the corner. Well, as I'm sprinting to the corner, the puck lands the top of the circle and it takes a hard bounce back toward the net. I go to stop and one of my laces was undone. I stick out, my lace kicks out from underneath me. I had to watch the puck roll into the net in front of 7,000 people. Oh. And for years, like that tortured me. And like, you know what, We're, really is like one of the reasons why I tried, um, where I made a little comeback for a while. Cause that moment was a precipice for me. That sat in my stomach for four years. And then I tried to make comebacks. So I was like, that can't be my last moment as a player. Cause that was one of my last games. And, you know, it's where I also learned something about myself. You can't let a moment define you, but that moment was very traumatizing. As you can tell, I, I'm even feeling it. Like I'm reliving it right now. So that's why when something bad happens to like my students, I'm like, shake it off. Don't define you. you that's a, it's a very small moment in time. But I also look at it as that's also a byproduct and where I watch how I coach now. When you force guys into something uncomfortable, you don't let them give feedback. They try to force their action. When they force it, it's unnatural. Exactly. 
Exactly. And it's amazing, right? When you think about those experiences of now that you have it so ingrained in you, how much you can relate it back to the pressure and the stress that these players go through now to be able to have that in your arsenal of feeling, right? Playing for that feeling of like, okay, I've got this thing. I can relate. Here's my story. And that's yeah. And you know what's saying? I've always hated it. I always love when you, do you ever hear that saying they say where those who can do and those who can't coach, mm-hmm. I've always hated that. I always say those who can do, but those who can't probably weren't coached right. Exactly. Or it. weren't, you know, it, you know, and it, granted, there's going to be people who can and can't, right. but I venture to say there are probably more people who can if we were more advanced in our coaching. A lot of times we like to blame the players, but the coach has a big onus on it. A thousand percent agree with that statement. The biggest part, right, I think that the misconception about coaching is that the ones that can, it's authentic coaching them. Because I know, I know the feeling. I know exactly what you're going through. Not, yeah. hey, I read some literature and now I'm regurgitating it and I don't actually know what the feeling is. And that there, And that's the fundamental difference between when we talk about coaching education, understand that process of that's the difference between the most successful coaches and everybody else is that the most successful actually know the feeling of what they're doing with it. And it's not coming from a place of, well, I heard it from this other coach who's in the NHL or this other coach is division one, but I don't actually know the essence, that feeling of what it is. And that's 100% spot on brother. I love that. I pointed that out. It's so true. So true. All right. I got one more. One more last one. Okay. And then I think this will lead you guys into where you want to go anyway. Yes. But if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing in the game, what would it be? Mm-hmm. So it could be a rule, whatever. But if you could change one thing in the game, for, at youth, pro, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. What would be one thing you'd like to see change in the game? Um, well, no that's, that's a deep question. I mean, I would like to see – and appreciation for all levels of talent. You look at what we glorify, we always glorify the top scorers, this and that. You know, one thing I always had an appreciation of, like I was with Trenton for two months and then a personal situation, I had to step away from the team, but there was a defenseman, Vince Williams, wasn't the offensive defenseman, but God, did he make me feel comfortable on the ice. Like I knew when the puck was on the strong side, I could just concentrate on my job because there was no way the puck, he would break somebody's wrist before he let somebody get a shot off on the weak side post. Yeah. But also this ties in with what, this is why I was so um, drawn to Vinny's message is how players look at the game. You don't need us. It's like, it's a mutual thing. Yeah, you want somebody to help you cultivate your talent, but you have a right, like players have to understand you should dictate your, nobody is going to dictate your path. You're going to dictate your path. There's no one way to do it. Like everybody's like, you have to do this route. No, you don't. There's, you look at the NHL, there's no one success story. If there was one path, everybody would be following it. And there would be some guy who would be a trillionaire because everybody, there's plenty of different paths. So an appreciation for individuals, what they bring to the game. And also, for coaches to appreciate each other instead of this, you know, I, I can't stand when I see coaches bad mouth each other. You know what? If somebody's mean spirited, fine, they're going to bring it on themselves. I don't need to bad mouth you. But I know for me, like in goalie coach coach, I learn from everybody. And I don't think I'm a, a know it all. You know, it's like I look at it as there's things that I do that work for guys. And then there's goalies I know have come to me and what I preach doesn't work for them. Well, yeah, then you should look for another coach. I, sh- I don't need to take that personal. I did early in my career and looked at it. How did I fail? So I'm not, you know, here's what I believe in. There's my set of values that doesn't work for you. Well, then, yeah, you do have to find what works for you. That's just life. People look to get, you know, to, they take things too personal and they don't rat, they don't sit there and think before you know they let their actions or their emotions take over yeah such a huge point right there um that that we all deal with on that part because i I totally feel you on that part of where have let go of guys that were division one players like playing the youth team like that i knew yeah yeah you're stud but you don't fit and you don't align with the beliefs and the values we have for the team and the structure of what i'm looking for and had already gone through a year with you and just knew like you're not a fit and it's all good 
but that's the part where there was always would make phone calls to other coaches and say, good kid. Yeah. Grab them and all that stuff. And that's the difference of how many coaches out there again are, you know, are understanding themselves enough to know, don't screw the kid. Don't, don't make it. So no, you have to stay on my team because your ego, it's so huge and all that. Right. It's, that's the kind of stuff that I couldn't agree more of if we work together. It's amazing how much further this game would go than how competitive we get, especially at the youth realm. The youth realm is, it's ridiculous because it means nothing. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It, in the grand scheme, all these rankings, all this stuff, and we've you know, discussed many times, it means nothing. It only means something for the adults in the room, the parents who aren't educated enough to understand what's going on, it literally means nothing because in the end, all that matters is once you hit 16, 17, now you start to get into the realm of, it means something. You're getting closer to a level now where now you got to play performance-based hockey. And it's, it's going to, now you're talking about like that for the ones that are committed to, you know, highly committed to their art and stuff like that. Um, but no. it's, it's wild. That's Bill. Bill, I don't know if you're pointing to That's one thing I would tell people because what t- time of year is coming up? Tryouts. It's the most stressful mm-hmm. time of year for parents. And I understand it. It's your child. But as for anybody going up, even up to Bantam Major, and I can say this, being a former Division One coach, change your mantra. Instead of chasing titles, chase development. I my my mom, God rest her soul, is the one thing she would do. She would never take me to a team where a coach approached her. Oh, we're great. Da 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 da. She would always take me to coach. Well, I like him, but he needs to work on this, and this is how we can help him. That, well, what do you want to chase, titles or development? Because if you develop, you're going to have more of a future. But more importantly in life, you're going to learn about putting yourself in the right situation. Like you can take the high paying job, but if it's something where you're going to be unhappy, what have you really accomplished? You know, and I'd rather take a job that pays a little less, but be happy and grow, be around my family, than have the high paying job and be miserable, you know. Mm-hmm. So true. So true. It's, uh, oh, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's spot on, brother. Like that, that's one of the biggest parts. Like right now you're hearing it all the time and you can appreciate this and you know, cause I'm sure you're dealing with the same thing of how many parents are, I got to go to this combine. I got to go to this development and camp development camp, whatever it is. And it's, they're spending, the irony is the amount that they spend on these weekends to go travel around and they need to go do 10 events when it's like, you do realize that if you cut that number in half, you just took care of like a legitimate summer of training, a legi- like a legit summer of training of development for yep. your, but no, you perceive because of the way the industry is, and this isn't their fault, right? This is the way, unfortunately, this is what the masses are, are taught to believe. The connections, if I go there and I learn, and, and I do this and it's like, no, and you hit, you hit it spot on. The development piece, the value of, completely go all in on your development when you're younger and it's amazing the product, right? I love the way Einstein says it, you know, don't become a man of success, become a man of value. And that's the reality is that those years when you're younger, oh my God, you've got so much time in front of you to develop that value because there's no pressure. There's none of this. We, we create the pressure. We create it by rankings and, oh, you've got to be on this uh, uh, super team and you've got to be here. We create that that thing in the air that we believe that illusion that you have to go do that stuff. When the reality is, no, you don't. How many players have you had? 17, 18, 19, getting their commits. They, they finally got to that point and said, holy cow, look what they turned into. And when they were 14, 15, nobody was paying attention to them. Everyone, nah, I don't see anything. Suddenly when they're 17, 18, it's like, holy cow, what happened to this kid? Yeah. And it's because hard work paid off. And you know what, this isn't even a, well, it's a hockey player, but what he accomplished, I had a player um, before that I coached when he was 14, you know, we'll we'll just say he was a rebel, you know, he was just very, he was so much like me that we would butt heads a lot, like arguments on the ice, you know, one time tried to check me during a practice, you know, like full scale, like that type of thing. And at 14, you'd be like, oh, most people would put on the label, oh, he's going to be nothing but trouble. Fast forward to this year, uh, my wife and I would go to a wedding. 
an outdoor wedding and the wedding's running late. Like when we get there, we thought we were going to be late. John holds the wedding up because he had to give me a letter and it was this three page letter. And it, he writes very small, like I'll share it with you one time. Um, very humbling. Like, he's like, you never let me settle, you know, was the gist of it. He's like, there were things that I wanted, but then I had to earn it. Um, well, it turns out now he's a lieutenant in the Marine Corps and he flies jets. Now, if you had told me at 14, he was going to be in charge of a, you know, multi-million dollar piece of machinery and he had missiles that can find my house. It was <laughs> very intimidating, but to see it was very, it was, I'll admit it was a really awesome moment, but also it's a very, it hits you with reality, the influence that you have. And like at his stage, like I was just getting into coaching and I'll admit, like I got the nickname Sarge and it wasn't the, a good thing. It was because I was a little bit of a hothead and it wasn't that I demanded perfection, but I just demanded, I was a very demanding coach. But I, you know, guys who I used to coach could tell you like, they knew what my intention was, thank God. Because I look at the way I used to coach and I'm like, man, you know, there's guys who I probably missed in that period that I, you know, wish I coach now. But, you know, at the same time, too, you don't know because you're in your infancy of coaching. It's a learning process. And that's where we all have to do better with communication, understanding. Like we have to understand our players because, you know, you've been a head coach. Yeah. 20 different players, 20 different personalities. How Johnny hears it may not be the way Mikey hears it. You have to take that time. That's our responsibility. Exactly. It's such an important piece to the development pie right there, right? Where the reason so many coaches struggle is because at the core of it, they operate on what they think. Well, I think this is how I should handle this player. I think this is how I'm supposed to the system we need to play. Uh, I think these are the type of practices we need to run. It's not coming from a place of, no, I know. And in order to know, you have to know yourself. And that's the biggest part that you see is a major issue of when, you know, I see uh, coaching education programs out there, right? In USA Hockey, all that stuff. Well, it's all good. You come in for a weekend and bam, people talk about a lot of X's and O's, how to have a better power play, face off, blah, blah. But the reality is the coach, the one who's the main influencer, we can't change our style until we actually know our style. Until we actually know ourselves, there's no way to, to convince somebody else, right? True confidence comes from what? What The art of confidence is feeling somebody, right? Like we have that innate thing in us, right? That, that part of our reptilian brain that people know authenticity. They know real. The only way to know real is to know you first, to know this is what I truly believe in. And so that's such an important part, right? You know, when we talk about that piece right there of how well you know what, who you are, what your needs are, because then from there, it's easy to coach. It's easy to develop. But unfortunately out there, a lot of people don't. And that's just reality. They, they, it, Cause it takes work. Right? Yeah. We, know, we know how much work I'm, I'm eight years ago. I'm good. Nine years going into the process through this. And I'm still, still learning like crazy of what this is all about this, mindset, this high performance piece, it's, it's like a never ending challenge. Right? It never, it never goes away. And that's a part that so many people in the development process don't realize is that I think the irony of development with players through all these years, but at least I took away, you know, from this journey so far is that exactly what you said of where the development part is if from the time they were young, if we taught them how to coach themselves, how to understand themselves better, they're going to become pilots. They, they're going to become whatever it is they're going to become. They're all going to be pros in something at some point. If we gave them that, it doesn't matter. The irony is I'm teaching to develop these players for NHL division one. The whole system is based around that. When the reality is if we taught uh, self-awareness, if we taught, if we taught understanding, okay, your unique abilities, focus on what those strengths are, what's your genius. Right. If, and, and imagine what you can be. If we taught more like that, everybody will still end up where they're going to be. The NHL players will still end up in the NHL. The, the division one will still end up in division one. But the difference is now that other side of the 98% is now feeling they're going to end up where they belong and they're going to be happy. And they would have learned all those skills from that development piece that happens in the game. And that's the beauty of when you talk about that stuff of how the, 
flipping the model, understanding what are we doing this for, right? And, and, and again, as coaches, as influencers, how are we perceiving this model and realizing, you know what, I've got more to give than I realize. It's not just about the X's and O's part. It's about connecting, getting players to believe in something that's bigger than themselves, you know, that's a part of a community and realizing, wow, I can do anything with the skills that I'm learning from this game along the way. So it's, yeah. it's awesome when you point out that stuff, buddy. This is, the, this is the stuff we can get into for hours and hours, but now I'm gonna try really you guys on. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> no, just some hellos. We've got, um, we've got um, Coach Tim. So what's up, buddy? Tim, what's up, what's Carl, up? you know, the original crew, Troy, Brian, Judah. Um, Judah Siomas? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. You're one of my best defensemen uh, got to play with. Him and I were little flyer teammates. Oh, that's awesome. That Keith, awesome. Edward, Sherman. Sherman. I recognize yeah. some of these names. Heather, thank you guys for joining us. Right, thank you guys. Um, let's see. Sorry. The, someone mentioned Marcy. The goalie school K uses for almost seven or eight years immediately started saying the new private lesson coach was bad old etc like not having the unity there that was one of the comments yeah. but a lot of lows great story of perseverance hey guys great work guys you know people are loving it so awesome awesome the words of led zeppelin ran a lot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we talked about a couple of these things so here's here's some stuff um george that i thought would be good to get into right it's like so let's talk about one of these questions is what for goalies right let's get into the specifics about goalies so what's some of the biggest struggles goalies go through today that could easily be fixed if they worked at it? Like, what are some of the things that you think that um, if they invested more time, what are the misperceptions maybe that exist that uh, goalies don't realize, right, that they should be putting their time into this? Well, I know one thing I'll say is, like, say you have an off game. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, what ends up happening is goalie thinks they have to change everything or oh I gotta do this differently no you know what there are going to be games you have to rise for as hard as you train forwards and defensemen train and some night you know if, if we were that perfect the game would always be zero zero and it would be boring it would be like playing tic-tac-toe you wouldn't do it anymore you have to have the confidence in yourself to rise there are going to be nights where you know you may have an off night whether you didn't prepare the way you normally do or just the other teams on fire. Um, it's had, you know, it's having confidence in yourself and in your own skill set that, you know, you're going to trip up once in a while, but having that confidence rise, oh, I can adjust to this, or hey, you know what? It's just a matter of me watching the puck in a little bit better. Two, one thing I would see when I was at ASU and Princeton. Many times it's easy for goalies to get caught up on shot count and parents. And I ask my goalies this all the time is they will get a, um, you know, I'll ask goalies, well, we lost three, one this weekend, but I had 40 saves. So, you know, what many, and then you go back and you look at the game film and say out of the 40 shots, you know, well, use a number like 17 of them originated from outside the dots or top of the circle out. And we all understand the game. Those are easier shots. Well, if you put 15 rebounds in the front, well, now your the defensemen now are under pressure because now they're scrambling for the puck and you got forwards coming downhill after the puck. So you took a shot that you could have easily maybe controlled or put into a better area. You're contributing to your shot count. So it's an easy thing instead of looking at your shot count being have pride in possession that I control the puck. Goaltenders aren't blockers. Goaltenders are your jobs. You're like the quarterback in football. Your jobs to control the game. So it's an, it's an easy mindset switch when you start looking at, Hey, I want possession as opposed to just, as opposed to just, you know, racking up saves. You're not there to rack up saves. You're there to put your team in a position to win the game. So, you know, that and just trusting that your skills will develop, like don't lock into a style. Um, I was a victim of that, like guy who helped me get to pro and he meant well. But when I was going through midget and junior style was the thing, you're a butterfly style goalie. Yeah. Look at some of the best goalies who have won Stanley Cups recently. Well, I shouldn't say recently, it was a little while ago, but Tim Thomas. 
he didn't really have a style. He just believed in himself. Like he wasn't considered what you would call graceful, but man, did he impose his will on a game. Marty Brodeur, you can't teach his style. He had the confidence, have the confidence to be yourself. Take what your coaches show you, use it as a foundation, but then don't be afraid to put your own blueprint on the game. It's a game. It's the greats have never followed a path. The greats have used a path as a starting point. And then when they got the confidence, they ventured and explored. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice. Reminds me of a quote I've seen recently. Uh, good, good coaches copy. Then it was like good, uh, great coaches steal. And I think that was, <laughs> was uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it goes the same way with players, right? Of where great players, like, you know, don't be afraid to say, you know what? I'm going to take this and put our own, put my own spin on it, right? And that's the thing I think as, as the human experience, the condition, we're afraid of it, of we feel like we see something. I mean, you look at, ironically enough, right? Facebook was, you know what? Instead of the Facebook, Facebook or whatever it is, right? It was kind of like, and then what he had done, Zuck, right? we see the movie and all that. He's like, well, I made it better. And that's the part I think that so many athletes don't get influenced enough to think about that. And that's such a huge point. Just thinking. Just, yeah, they just, well, they're thinking they're copying, right? Like, okay, well, somebody coach told me to do this. Someone else is doing this. No, but I meant like free thought. Like No, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, for sure, for sure. Um, as we build upon that, buddy, what, another part, right, is that, so what skills have you had to say that are non-negotiable, right? What skills do you feel that goalies should be investing most of their time into when they're younger? So obviously they need to find their identity. They got to do their own thing. What's some of the stuff that's just absolutely non-negotiable? If I want to play at the highest levels possible and I want to imprint unconsciously into my instinctive behavior and my movements and all that stuff, what are the things that when I'm young, 8, 9, 10, 11, make sure really put your time into these what? Um, well, one, I'm a big believer in strong skating skills because let's face it, games played on skills, on, on skates. Yeah. And I've found the most co confident, and patient goaltenders are the ones that can hold their ground. And, you know, because when you know you're good on your feet at, in goaltending, if you move first, you open up net. So you're skating. It's a non-negotiable. Like you have to be able to move and you got to have that confidence that, you know, you, can, you have that patience to read the play. Second is controlling the game, which briefly touched on. Get out of looking at shot counts, you know, especially like up to Bantam Major. Everybody's so worried about save percentage. Number one, it's youth hockey. Nine out of 10 people are doing the score clock, don't understand what a shot is. They'll miss rebounds. Like everybody's worried about shot counts. Play well. People will know who, who's good. Don't get caught up with shot counts, but understand what controlling the game is. And there's many facets. It's not just controlling the rebound or catching the puck when it comes to your glove. It's knowing when to play the puck. Do I leave it for my defenseman or, hey, should I make a pass here? Indirect things. Be able to communicate, you know, talk to your teammates because you can see the whole ice. A lot of times, you know, pay attention when your coaches are talking about defensive zone coverage because then you can help your teammate out. Hey, you need to be over here based on what we're doing where everything falls apart. Developing a rapport with your teammates. Uh, one of the best things I saw was one of the starting goalies every year uh, to play with, well, I shouldn't say every year because I was on a different team, but the one year he took all his defensemen out to dinner beginning of the year and just like, hey, what language do you guys like? And he's like, realize there's going to be different expectations, but let's get on the same page here. Um, and don't be afraid. I don't, the only time I use the word failure is when you don't try, yeah. but realize you're going to give up goals. Put your, know how to categorize your goals. Was it an earned goal or is it one you want back? And the ones you want back, be able to be self-critical. Hey, you know what? I didn't watch it in. You know, journaling right after a game. What What did you see on the situation? Like, I think it's important, and this is something I learned from you, is take a look first at, write down what you think you saw, but then go look at it on video because this way you get a perception of what your coach sees, what your teammates see, and then what you're saying, and now you know how to break the game down. Exactly. What I love about everything is just talk to teammates, read the play, report, learning how to deal with the adversity, be honest with yourself. You know, it's amazing, like, as you start going down all those, those are all soft skills. 
quote unquote soft skills, right? Those are the skills that ultimately there's, yeah, I can learn how to move side to side. I can learn about my glove position. I can learn all that stuff. But the reality is what you just pointed out right there was all the stuff that we're not influenced to think that you can actually teach that stuff. And that's, that's where I feel the game is really behind um, in terms of development, but that was awesome. and so spot on of when you talk about those are the pieces that again, who's influencing you, who are you around that's teaching you to think that way and respond and learn how to do that. Cause that's, that's the time you get. It's a lot different when you're eight or nine uh, failing and going through adversity than when you're 19, 20 and you never learned how to deal with it when you were younger, right? It's, it's a lot different on that part. And I guess that's another thing that it brings up to me. One of the things I always find interesting, right, is that um, what's your thoughts on goalies and where they should be playing, like positioning themselves as they're younger? Because one of the things that I'm always, you know, in the goalies that we've dealt with um, over time is that it's putting you into a position where go play on a weaker team. Go, go face a ton of shots and feel that puck all over the place. Like I get it on the one end, you want to build confidence, be on a winning team. But on the other end, I always looked at it as, yeah, but isn't it great to get a ton of shots and, and learning how to move and react and all that stuff. So what's your take kind of on that perspective on goaltending development and how important that is to be in that type of environment versus playing a super team and facing 10 shots a game and, well, you know what? You you just nailed it on the head because, like, number one, I made a mistake because in college, yeah, I played D3, but I played on a last-place college team. That's a long time to do it. Like, I got peppered, but it was to the point, like, that school wasn't anything on our teammates, but that's a school I probably should have went to a different school. I went there because I looked at them like, hey, it's last-place team. Maybe I can help them out. Didn't do my research. It was a school that should have been playing ACHA. So the shots – it became an unrealistic scenario. I saw a lot of things, but I didn't learn how to win. What I learned when I was there is how to be a backup. Now, importantly, what we're dealing with as kids here, honestly, right through Pee Wee, you know, there's always going to be a team that, you know, will label itself AAA that maybe shouldn't be. Right. You don't want to end up on a last place team because then they lose their love of the game. So let's face it. It's not always about winning. You do have to learn how to take losses, but if you put yourself in a situation where you're never winning, that's tough. And being on a first place team, like sometimes you get these super teams. If you're getting a shot a game, that stinks. What I tell people is all the way up to Bantam Major, if you're a goalie looking for a team, I would try to find a team that was either slightly above 500 or slightly below 500 the year before. Because go be a difference maker. Maybe you're that missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, might, it's just tough. You know what? Might play. Find a team where... You have a coach who has a passion. He's going to let you make mistakes. He's going to let you figure out what type of, well, let your child figure out what type of goal they are. But you need to enjoy the experience. It might is about learning the skills, but learning the love of the game. Yeah. Square, it gets a little more involved. Do your homework. Where are you going to develop? Look for a middle of the pack team. Same thing, Pee Wee and Bantam. Now, Midget, Junior, obviously the stakes get a little higher. Depends on what your goals are. If you're looking to be a division one athlete, yeah, you're going to have to look at the higher end teams because while locally, maybe you're dominating when you go to those tournaments, hopefully it's balanced out. So. Yeah. It's awesome. Powerful. Um, it's, it, it's amazing, right? The perspective of how it is, but I love how um, you kind of categorize that to the 500 stuff, right? Cause it, again, gives you that somewhat of a clear direction, right? For anybody that is listening in a simple way, right? There's, there's a measurable way to look at something when we talk about data and not overusing it, but there's a great way to be able to use that again for yourself as you're making a judgment call, you know, as you move forward. I love that. Did you have something? I mm -hmm. do, but I don't know if the, now's the right time. Okay. Something that comes up, I feel like, that okay. has come up yeah. recently. Um, and I guess my assumption is that this is really more for older players a little bit, but teams that take three goalies. Three goalies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, it's come up. That's the oh, only reason. Yeah. And you're here and you're live. And I know that this is something that, you know, yeah. oh, my kid is now in a situation where they weren't going to take three. Now all of a sudden yeah. there's three Great goalies. Topic. So I just, I don't know what the question is, but something about three goalies. And I figured you guys could add in the hockey parts of that. He's going to know exactly where to go with that. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, um, the unfortunate thing is at junior and college, you're going to say it because 
number one, like colleges, I understand it because you'll have the senior goalie, like they have, you can't go to because you always see if you go to, you get an injury. Now, if you haven't recruited, you can't at the college and junior levels, it's such a competitive level, you can't go out and get somebody. Um, it, I, yeah, you have to temper it, but like up into to midget, honestly, it should be too. I mean, yeah. that I understand injuries happen, but at the same time too, like you have to play and you've got to be able to develop. Um, but you have to accept like when you're an upper level guy, you're going to have to pay dues like a junior, you know, unless you're the, the phenom, you're going to come in, you're going to pay your dues. You may be the second or third. And that's just what it is. Um, I understand both points of view. Like you want to go to a team where it's just two, but I would say on up to midget, if you can find a situation where it's two, that's what you want to do. Uh, junior in college, you have to understand where, where the teams are coming from. They have to, you know, especially successful organization, they're going good teams don't go unprepared into the season. So. Yeah. 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 It's, it's definitely an issue. And, and again, that's the other side of it too, is you definitely deal with it a lot higher level. Well, I feel like what happens is at least from what I've heard from my perspective with parents is that they're in a situation where they're told it's going to be two, but then it's always like something happens in the 11th right. hour. And now all of a sudden you're at camp and now there's three. So it's like, always seems to be the surprise. Like, oh, oh yeah. we came here because it was two, but surprise, now there's a third. Well, so listen, I, I, I dealt with the situation once when I, when I was in Wilkesburg with that, mm -hmm. right? On the 18 team was, so we had two goalies and that's the way it was going to be. The one goalie, yep, you're going to get 80, 85% of the games. The other goalie, and I learned from that of realizing, okay, not going to put myself in that type of situation again. <laughs> but the other kid knew. The other kid knew, hey, you're going to play 10 to 15% of the games. And that's just the way are you okay with that? And we went with two. Well, lo and behold, the guy that ended up was uh, was the number one gets injured. He's out for six to eight weeks. Yeah. There's no, we have to get another guy. Like there's nothing we can do. So we got in that situation where we had to bring in a third because the other goalie was not there, was not designed to, hey, we can't. Like well, there's nobody we can bring up. Yeah, and people have to be realistic about that. And you know what I'm bringing that up to is there's another important point is because I had a goalie who should have dominated as a D1, but they ruined it for him in youth. Like I had a goaltender where his dad demanded he was the only goalie yeah. all the way up through midget. Yeah. Okay. And he, hey, rightfully, he would dominate. Yeah. But then you know what happens when you're younger, Vin. Then it's very easy to be way ahead of everybody. Of course. And as you get older now, the cream starts rising. Exactly. The adversity, exactly. So go through magic, boom. Even in prep school, okay, they had a backup goalie but never played. But now you get to college. And you got to D1, but here's the problem. Nobody is going to take one goalie at Division One. Now all of a sudden he got there, and it wasn't him as a 1A, and then you had like a 2D. It was a 1A and a 1AAA. And now all of a sudden he didn't know how to compete for the job. You're not doing your kid any favors if you want to teach them, like, oh, well, they need to learn the game. Yeah, they need to learn the game, but guess what? They also need to learn how to compete. They need to learn. I hear people say all the time, oh, well, it's not fair. No, what you have to take the rose tenant classes off. Did they compete if one's doing better? Not on what you think is good or making excuses. If somebody beats you out for a job, then figure out a way how to take your job back. You have to learn how to compete. It's so important. Exactly. Another, another major soft skill, right? That grit, grit is a term. Andrew Duckworth talks about that, but like that's that whole thing is like how how understanding that that's a skill, learning how to deal with it. Because in the beginning, you might not be great at it. If, if this right, if this player would have when he was younger had to deal with it and just realize, okay, I'm not very good at it. But then after two years, three years, by year four or five, got pretty good. Okay, now I know how to deal with it. Boom. Now going into that same position. It's a totally different experience. But because of all those years, and you see with players too, parents coming in, who's on the team. It's so funny, right? Because it's like the parents who are asking who's on the team, it's never the top players that have to ask that question. If you notice, the top players don't ask that question. They come in, they go, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm in, let's go. But then yeah. it's the ones that want to be attached to that. Well, who else is, is going to be on? I just got to make sure. 
the top, 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 they don't, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm coming. That's it. That's such a great point because what do the best players do? They make everybody else around them better. They're not worried about, well, who's going to help me? No, I'm going to help you. I'm going to do my thing. Are you coming along for the ride? Exactly. And these are all things I learned. Like, you know what? Like when I played, I'll admit it. Like there were times where I was a backup. Oh, I'm better than him. But you know what? With age now, I look, every goalie that I backed up to in the minor leagues, they were better than me. Like at the time, I didn't want to admit it because, you know, we're guys. You go first. Just like we overstate colds, right, Ben? We, <laughs> but, uh, we have our egos and, you know, we're, we have fragile egos. We want to say we're the best. Look, my my rookie year played behind the goalie Wayne Marion. He, you know, just he just had that. He knew how to put his will on the game. And my last year, I played a guy named Andrew Allen. God, watching him in training camp in 2003 uh, with Trent, how calm he was, and just watching him make saves. I was like, this guy's a whole other level. And you know, it's. When you allow yourself to appreciate the talent for, and around you, you learn from it. But if you hold a, an animosity towards your competition, you don't learn. You just sit there and see that. And whenever there's negative energy in your body, it doesn't serve a purpose. Exactly. And that's a signal. It's like, it's like getting sick, right? I think it's that same thing. Of like when you feel that negativity, it's your spirit, your soul telling you, okay, something's off. And that, yep. that just that little signal, just like getting injured, ha having a sickness and all the same thing. I'm like, it's just giving you some type of direction signal. Yeah. I want to point out here, because this is the parent chat, that this is George as a player. And I don't know, you know, but like as parents, when we're sitting in the stands, it may not be obvious to us. Right. It may not feel that way as to mom and dad watching your kids sit on the bench as a backup in that situation. But that's why it's so important to keep the dialogue open with your kids because chances are either that kids got to compete in the fire and they're going to come back or they know this was the right decision for today. I didn't have, I wasn't prepared and whatever, like coach was checking it out. I didn't have a good practice this week or whatever it is. Like as a parent, when you're sitting on the bench at game time, we're only able to see a small sliver of the big picture of what coach's decision is and what's mm -hmm. going on with the team. And it's just, so I just wanted to point that oh, out yeah. for our parents that are watching that our perspective is not the same as the perspective as the coach and the other players on the team. So what George said is really powerful, but I don't know, you know, if you were to ask like your parents or your fans that were there at that time, would they have the same feelings you were? It's like, wow, this kid's different. He's on another level. I know, you know, like, it, it's different from the stands. And of course it's our kid. We want to be like, Oh my God, you're the best. I love you. Like, I don't want anything bad to happen to you, but like we have to be, and like my heart goes out to goalie parents. Cause I don't think I'd be able to handle it, but um, you know, it's important that we realize our perspective is not the perspective and that's in anything in life, but specifically with a child that's playing a sport and in a position like goalie, where there's only one on the ice at a time per team that, yeah maintaining that level of perspective and having open dialogue with your kid will be a lot more powerful than just bitching about why your kid didn't get the start. Yeah. So that's my only. No, exactly. I'm trying to think of there's a, a psychological term too for that of where, yeah. Man, we're all a mess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing we're all on the computers. We can't infect anybody else, but. Ooh. But it, it's a reality of uh, it's, it's normal that, with your child, of course. you get completely zoned in, right? It's like the, it's the equivalent of the analogy of being a player versus being a coach. When you're a player, you're completely focused on yourself. You are zoned in on you, what you need to do. You learn everything about, you know, the habits, what, what things you need to work on, making sure eating right, sleeping right, what skills you're working on. Well. The moment that you switch over from being a player to a coach, you're looking at it totally different. It's like a whole new world just opened up. Now you're looking at it like, it's like going from checkers to chess. Like suddenly it's like, holy cow, like there's a whole team now of people that I've got to understand how to manage, change, perspective, deal with differently. And that's the part that parents, it's very hard to do that. Of um, course. I guess I just want to like no, no, keep you're, the no, negative language yeah, yeah. in check. Yeah, yeah, of course. Don't just be of like, course. oh my God, I can't believe coach didn't start you. I'm so mad. Like 100%. we always say, let the kid lead the way. Right, look at it. Yeah, exactly. 
let your child and their feelings lead the way because they might be like, you know what? He earned it this week or she yeah. earned it this week. But that's the part they don't know. Right. That's but, the so it's okay to like be upset, but we have to, as parents, right? We're trying just to keep the language, yeah. keep the nonverbal behavior, exactly. you know, in check on things and don't make a situation worse. That's my only, that's what I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, no, and you know what? It's important too, because <clears throat> what I've learned this year, like, and I'll even use Vin, Vin for this, but also um, when I was out in Arizona, I uh, developed a good friend, uh, Derek Morris, who's a 18 year veteran in the NHL, the, uh, Calgary, Phoenix, Colorado. Um, sometimes I get rose tinted glasses because, you know, the kids you coach, you're going to be loyal to them if they've done everything you've asked. But I would get his perspective because, you know, a lot of times you go to goalie guys, they have, I'd go to him. I was a defenseman. What do you say? And that's something I've learned to do is like, I realize that like my perspective sometimes needs refreshing as well. And I wish, you know, I'd done it earlier in my career, but now if, you know, I'll get feedback from one coach, but then I'll listen to another and find like a common ground. And, I, you know, I'll speak to my goalies about it and see, and they're like, Oh, I can see that. You know, it's something where the more information you have, you take as much as you can use what, take what's useful discard the rest. Bruce Lee, right? Uh, then. Love, love that one. So true. So true. Yeah, well, it's been about an hour, so I'm going <laughs> to wrangle us in, right, to start to close up. I have a couple of uh, announcements, if I may. Yes, you may. Okay, so <laughs> obviously we have George here, and George is our newest bloodline hockey coach, so what the hell does that mean? <laughs> that means we've got goalie programming coming up, right? Mm -hmm. So, we have um, three things I wanted to bring your attention to. If you're interested in private, you know, I'm going to use the word mindset, but you know, we can call it performance and especially Absolutely. really honing in on those soft skills. Yeah. You know, that's what all of our situation, all of our programs do, but specifically tiered for goalies, we will have private coaching. And again, this is all virtual. No matter where you are watching this in the world, we can help you. <laughs> um, private coaching, we are going to be having a goalie group this off season. Um, we're going to bring a small group of goalies together to really kind of learn what we're talking about today, enhancing their game, but together in a small group. And then finally, here in the New Jersey area, we are going to have a goalie shooter mastermind event. So obviously, what you're talking about, talking to defensemen, you know, as a goalie and, and, and for players to hear what the goalie's perspective is. And we want to bring goalies and shooters or defensemen, whatever you want to call it, goalie and shooters together, right, to mastermind together. So that how can we make each other better? So those are three things we have coming up this offseason for you. Uh, private coaching is actually available now. Uh, but if you are interested at all in how Bloodline Hockey can help you as a goalie or can help your child as a goalie, all you need to do is type goalie in the comments um, now or whenever you're watching this, and we will be in touch with you with more information as it becomes available. So um, that's my spiel. Good spiel. Thanks. <laughs> Let's give a big, big, big thank you to George. Huge. Uh, thank you, guys. And uh, looking forward to this. Uh, you know, it's you know, as I'm learning, it's going to be good because it's, it's going to be a fun thing because I'm going to be learning as my students learn because I know a lot of them are going to be interested and it's, you know, and for those who I get to meet out there, looking forward to uh, helping you out. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're fortunate to have you, buddy. Yeah. I love having the family and uh, obviously, yeah, nothing but big things coming along. We only get stronger together. We only get stronger. So, Love it, brother. And thank you for taking the time today to yeah, jump on with us. Thank you. And awesome, guys. Hopefully we all feel better soon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Get that vitamin C. Absolutely. Exactly. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Yeah, see have you. a great night. Bye. Bye.